Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel Ray and I am happy to be here with Mr. Ray. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Today we are going to do a Theory Tuesday video where we talk about something weird and wacky uh, and I have no idea what we're talking about and James is going to fill us in. Right? You're going to tell the story. I'll, yeah, I'm going to fill you in. I'm going to, it's going to be educational. Excellent. Uh, before we get started, I'll tell you what I'm working on. I am working on this Oraloa painting called Time to Witch. You might have seen me unbox this last year. Uh, this is a company that has licensed artwork, and I will have a link to this painting down below in the description box. Um, I am using, sorry, I have a brain fart. I am using my Enablers Outpost pen that I got. It is a flower girl blank and Edward turned this and it's so beautiful. I love it. Uh, I'm also using a tray from Shiny Shazza. I really like it. I wanted to coordinate all the purples and the greens. So <laughs> that is what we're working with today. And uh, I'm using Diamond Art Club release paper because I have a lot of it and I prefer to do sections like this when I'm diamond painting. Without further ado, let us chat. Yeah, let's have a chat, yeah. How are, how are you today, darling? Um, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm not too bad. Good. Um, we need to get you diamond painting one of these days, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you think you could handle it? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I could talk and diamond paint at the same time. Right? Mm, you'd be surprised. Yeah. Anyway, um, what'd you find? Well, I suppose... In the interests of drama and stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. <laughs> it's April 1933. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Picture a young married couple. Okay. Yeah. They're walking through a lightly wooded area. The lake is lapping softly in the near distance. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have stayed out so late. Uh -oh. Now it's going to be dark by the time you get to the bikes. Mm -hmm. We'd best hurry along this path through the woods. Mm -hmm. And then you hear a crashing behind you. And you turn around just in time to see this 20 foot long creature with two fins and a long neck and a head like a horse with a long snout on it. As it oh my God. itself across the road like that, you know? <laughs> In a kind of slinking manner uh -huh. and off into the clearing and you hear as it goes into the lake and and that is, that the pulse? is the start of the modern Loch Ness monster Ooh, yeah we're talking about Loch Ness we're talking about Loch Ness yeah yay yeah um Nessie good old Nessie like my yeah. favorite so the, do you know what do you know about Loch Ness uh it's in Scotland yeah. And uh, there's a thing. There's a picture. And it looks kind of like a brachiosaurus. Yeah. Oh, no, not a brachiosaurus. The other one. A pleosaurus. I pleosaurus. Think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what they are. Um, yeah, that's what they say. We'll, we'll get on to that. But like Loch Ness is a lake um, just kind of west of Inverness. Okay. In Scotland. Inverness is on the east coast of Scotland. Yeah? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's part of like a series of lakes, big, long glacial lakes that run the whole kind of uh, course of Scotland in a sort of straight line, you know. Mm -hmm. And they were linked up in like the early uh, 19th century as part of this thing called, I think it's called the Caledonian Canal, you know. Okay. And it's, but like these lakes now, they're really narrow and they're really, really long. Mm -hmm. And if I was any good at taking notes, I would have written down some details about it here, but I didn't. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what I basically know off the top of my head, and it'll probably be kind of wrong, you know? All right. But okay. It, it, is, it is a massive lake, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, not just in the surface area, but it's not huge in the surface area, but the actual depths in it. Like, Loch Ness holds more water than all of the other lakes in Britain put together. Hmm which would be Scotland, Wales, and England, you yeah. know? Like, all of those lakes put together. It is very, very long, 
I'm going to say somewhere in the range of maybe 150 to 200 miles long hmm. and maybe a couple of miles wide but it's very very deep okay you know like I think that they've they haven't really um it likes to get philosophical <laughs> it likes to get philosophical late at night yeah <laughs> um it's it's um I think that 208 meters is a depth that they have which is about the bones of 700 feet you know hmm. so and it's it's not very all of these lakes by the way are like they're very they they were carved out by glaciers you know mm-hmm. so they're very very narrow and they're very very deep so in a in a lot of ways they're mysterious lakes yeah because also all of these lakes are they're fed by streams coming down off the highlands and they run through peat peat bogs and stuff. Mm-hmm. So all of the water is very murky. Like visibility is next to nothing. Okay. In these in these lakes. Neither. So they're all like that. They're all mysterious. But another interesting thing as well, the biologists among you may realize is that if they're that steep and that deep, then the actual place where there's vegetation growing in the water and there's different habitats and stuff that they form mm-hmm. and everything. They are all along the, the surface. just the very outside of the lake, you know. Right. Within within a very short period, it's too deep and it's too murky for any vegetation to grow. So there's there's that kind of quality to them, and um, they don't have a hell of a lot of um, uh, biology or whatever going on in them, you know. Right. Um, but they are. But Ness, Loch Ness is a massive lake, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the crack. Um, it's also quite historic, you know. What happened? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of stuff happens, but <laughs> I'm just trying to. I, if I, I would have written it down, it's got that famous castle on it. I think it might be called Urquhart Castle or something like this. Okay. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Mm-mm. All right. Well, yeah. Okay. I know nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's well. Anyway, look, it's that's that's the crack with it. It's a very very big lake. Very yeah. big lake. Very deep. Very deep. Very dirty. Very, very murky. I would describe it as <laughs> murky. Um, so, like, there's there's always been kind of legends about something in the lake or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, there's the one of the things I came across was this thing called a selkie, you know? Now, Ooh, silkies. Yeah, but what's your understanding of a selkie? Oh, it's different. Yeah, like a selkie is... Um, selkie is like a half woman, half otter... No seal. Yeah, it's a seal. It, it, it's a it's a seal that wears the look of a woman, or a woman that wears the look of a seal. You know, depending on who's telling the story and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But the sulkies that are associated with Loch Ness take the form of these beautiful horses. Oh yes. And, and they it, like it's weird when you read the story because it says and they entice you to climb on its back. I've never actually come across a horse. <laughs> In the middle of nowhere, and I've been like, I think this horse wants me to ride it. <laughs> you know, it's a weird thing to think like, how would a horse indicate that? <laughs> be like, just sit there, and you'd be like, did that horse just wink at me? And now it's nodding at its back. You know, hey buddy, have fun. <laughs> and then, but when you climb on the back of the horse, it takes off at high speed, mm-hmm. like a puka. Mm. Do you know, which is the Irish ghost horse. It's basically a puka. Okay. And it takes off at high speed and it jumps and plunges into the lake and that person is never seen again. Ooh. So people that go mysteriously disappearing, like they, they say, oh, they've been taken away by the sulky and stuff like that. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> then in the um, in the 6th century, um, friend of Theory Tuesday, St. Columba, I'm, I'm sure I, could, I, I rack my brains, I'm sure Columba came up in a different one. But you, you, Columba, anyway, is, he's an Irish, um, what would you say, missionary. And he left Ireland in the 6th century. He founded um, the Iona, you know, the monastery at Iona. Yeah. She's supposed to be the first uh, Christian monastery in Scotland. Hmm. And he's there and he's spreading um, Christianity to the Picts, you know, the local um, indigenous people. Okay. And they were given the name, we don't actually know what they're called, because they were given the name Picts by the Romans, mm. because they like to paint themselves with woad, which is a type of blue pigment, you know, mm-hmm. um, going into battle. And 
there's an indication that they may have had tattoos and stuff like that, so the Romans called them the painted. Hmm. And they also have, they also left behind like a load of kind of um, art from that period, which is like late Bronze Age, early Roman period in, in um, Britain, you know? Mm-hmm. And they would have carved them in in caves and they would have carved them onto stones and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so Columba's there and he's spreading Christianity to the Picts. And he's travelled the whole way across Scotland from the west coast, from Iona. And he's got all the way to um, to the east coast. Mm-hmm. And he's on the banks of Loch Ness. And him and there's a pick leader and there's his assistant. We'll call him Steve. <laughs> so there's Columba, the pick leader and Steve. Mm-hmm. And up comes this dreadful monster out of the water and grabs the picked guy and pulls him into the ocean or pulls him into the lake. Mm-hmm. And takes him down into the briny deep. And Columba's assistant steps forward and he's like, God, oh, murder you, you crazy... Harsh. Fucking harsh, whatever you are. <laughs> I'll murder you. And the monster comes up again, you know. And he grabs Columba's companion. And then Columba steps forward and he's like... And I like what's happened here is I have, I have um, uh, quotation marks. But I, I never I never put the quotation in here. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> he says he says something like, Away with you, you know what I mean, whatever monster and anyway the the monster drops the assistant and, and goes back into the deep and because of this amazing show, the pit leader realizes that the Christian God is the one true God. And ah. it's all sorted then. Yeah? Okay. So that's one of the earliest legends where there's an actual monster in the lake, you know, mm-hmm. as opposed to a kind of puka thing um, traveling around the outside um, okay. and luring people in. Mm-hmm. Um, I would assume I didn't look into it too deeply, but I would assume they also have other uh, th- because the the description of the Selkie is basically a puka, the Irish ghost horse mm-hmm. that takes you for a ride through the night and, you know, shows you horrible things. Um, so I would imagine that that they're going to have some kind of banshee based mythology around lakes and waters, ways and rivers as well same as in Ireland because they're quite close yeah Um, yeah. so I suppose this couple anyway you know there's 1930 something yeah 1933 in April of 1933 and do you know there had been people saying they'd seen strange things at the lake and stuff but no one ever really had any concrete descriptions and a lot of them kind of would have leaned on older stories, yeah? Mm-hmm. So then when this couple sees it, one of the things they point out in the paper is that the creature that they saw mm-hmm. is similar to the picked engravings, which seem to give it some kind of legitimacy. Okay. And then from April the whole way through the summer, there's tiny, tiny sightings. Oh, I saw something strange. And when I looked around, it was just going down. And mm-hmm. I saw the tail come out of the water, you know, or I was on a boat and this dark shape passed underneath me, you know. That's what you think, yeah. And they're all appearing in the newspapers. Mm-hmm. And then in, in later in that year, a couple of months later, a guy called Hugh Gray is taking his Labrador for a walk. You know, mm-hmm. and Hugh is a kind of amateur photographer or whatever. And again, it, it's that kind of golden hour, you know, mm-hmm. like it's late in the evening and he's taking his dog for a walk on the lake shore. And um, he he claims that he was just heading home. He heard a splash behind him. He turned around. What? Oh, wow. There is a huge neck with a head on it sticking out of the water. And he just got the camera up. Snap. It's gone. You know, and. Mm-hmm. Um, just like that, two or three seconds. Yeah. Yeah. And the the picture appears to show a kind of a long neck thing, but it's very, very blurry. And it was it was late in the evening, so it's pretty dark. Yeah. Um so that's Hugh Gray's photograph. So now that there's a photograph of the, the, the monster, you know, the paper started to go absolutely bananas. And is this the famous one? This is not the famous one yet. It's not the one you're picturing. Okay. Um <laughs> The yeah, so the the papers go absolutely bananas. So the papers are like, oh my god, I can smell a media frenzy. Yeah, you know, yeah, like we could sell a lot of papers with this. Mm-hmm. So they do the only reasonable thing that there is to do, and they hire a guy called Marmaduke Weatherall. 
Marmaduke Weatherall. Marmaduke Weatherall. What a name. Marmaduke... You haven't even heard all of it yet. <laughs> it's Marmaduke Arundel Weatherall. Arundel. Arundel. Ar Arundel. Yeah, he goes by... Huh. He, he goes by Duke. <laughs> Duke Weatherall. I wonder why. <laughs> and uh, Duke Weatherall is a bit... He's a bit of a character, like... He, I know what you're thinking. Is this the same Duke Weatherall that was a star of South African silent movies and then transitioned into directing his own movies during the talkings in the late 20s and early 30s? Yeah, that's the guy, Rachel. You got oh. him. You got him. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, he was he was a star of like silent movies in, in, in South Africa huh. and some British silent movies. He was born in Bodmin in, in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, like somehow he just ended up be becoming a star of South African silent movies <laughs> and in the 20s he started producing and directing movies and then so he produced directed and played the lead ro roles in a production of Livingston and Robinson Crusoe mm -hmm. um, he also uh, made this absolutely um, massive like action film in 1927 called The Psalm mm -hmm. which is based on the, the battle in World War One. And he was planning on um, he was planning on doing a movie on the life of um, oh, what's the name of that guy Lawrence of Arabia Ooh. what's that dude's name planning on doing a, a, a movie on him but it failed and um, he was also while he was over in um, South Africa got into kind of big game hunting you know and and like I've read a lot on this guy and he's pretty interesting but like if you kind of just do you know those guys in Ireland that they call characters the old fellas that they call characters yeah you know where it's just that they're they have tall tales they're yeah they're charismatic and they have tall tales and um like now they're tall tales but when they were younger you'd imagine that they talked people into all kinds of situations well he basically talked the daily mail into writing him a check to go and hunt this monster <laughs> and he rocks up wow. and he's got um you know a photographer and he's a, he's 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 got big guns. He's going to go out and he's going to capture this creature, you know? Yeah. And um, he's he's kind of um, what I'm saying. He's kind of uh, rushing around the place looking for this creature. Mm -hmm. And then after about a week or two, um, he comes back and he's got all these photographs of him on the shore. And there in the ground are these massive footprints in the soft ground. And he's like going, well, we had a witness and we rushed down here. And well, here are these footprints right here in the in the mud at the edge of the lake, like mm -hmm. and everything like this. So <laughs> that's cool. He, the, the photographer photographs him beside the feet. They've got pictures of the feet and everything like this. And they send it to um, the Daily Mail in it uncharacteristically and decides to double check stuff and they send the um they send the photographs to a couple of zoologists mm -hmm. and the zoologists straight away go uh, this is a hippopotamus these are hippopotamus legs actually all of these are a hippopotamus's left front leg <laughs> um, and it turns out that uh well they never found the offending weapon but they accused Marmaduke of faking it using a hat stand that was made out of a rhinoceros's foot. <laughs> hat stand? Yeah, it's so weird, isn't it? Oh, dear. Like, imagine the leap in imagination where you're looking at a rhinoceros and you're thinking, that would make a great hat stand. I don't know what to do with the rest I mean, of it. yeah. That front one there on the left. You can really see a couple of umbrellas inside that. <laughs> But they because they used to make ashtrays out of elephants' feet and everything, you know. Yeah, it was really sickening, actually. It is pretty sickening. So anyway, um, Weatherall denies that he has anything to do with it, and he said that he must also have been duped by this, you know, and mm -hmm. that it's been all over the papers. In a way, it's your fault. You're advertising that I'm all up here, and you know what I mean. People are are liable to pay hoaxes on me. Um, I can't work under these conditions, and. He, he leaves, you know? Wow. Yeah. And then really not. nothing really, the, the sightings kind of continue, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but nothing anymore. And this is all through the end of, of um, 1933 and into 1934. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. 
So then along comes this guy, Robert Kenneth Wilson, in mm-hmm. a kind of spring of, of 1934, yeah? Mm-hmm. Robert Kenneth Wilson is also a very interesting um, character, mm-hmm. you know? Now, he's born in 1899 in Madagascar. His family are uh, part of the empire, you know? Right. So he's born in Madagascar, goes to London, and in 1926, he uh, becomes a royal fellow of the College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, and he spends three years in general practice, you know? Yeah. So that brings him up into 1929, yeah? Yeah. He then... Um, joins the the army mm-hmm. and he becomes a surgeon in the army. Yeah? Right. Um, and they give him rank straight away because he's been three years in private practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Do you know what he did in private practice? What? Gynecology. Doesn't seem like it would be much use in the army. In the, in the war? Na- <laughs> Doesn't seem like it would be much use in the army in the 30s. But anyway, it's a bit crazy, isn't it? I mean, everybody wants to be special. So this is in the 30s <laughs> and they put him in like he's he's very good. Like he's, you know, he has a really good career, you know, mm-hmm. like I think once he joins the Navy, once he joins the army because of his time as a specialist and all this, like studying to be a specialist. Mm-hmm. They kind of give him a job and he runs a number of different army hospitals for them, you know, first is kind of like. Um, vice head of surgery in, you know, in the hospital in Plymouth or wherever, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he might have joined, started as a Navy guy or something like that. And then they, they make him, so he's basically had a very successful career, yeah? Yeah. And about five or six years after he joins the army, then he goes to visit um, uh, Loch Ness. And it's 1934 and it's after all of these sightings have been here, Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and he goes up and uh, basically he's the guy that takes the famous picture that you're thinking of. Mm. And when when he took the picture, um, he sent it to a number of newspapers and he asked that they don't mention his name. So they called it the surgeon's photograph. Mm. And this is the one, this is the guy, Robert Kenneth Wilson. Okay. He's the surgeon that took the photograph. Yeah. One of the newspapers accidentally printed his real name and he was actually fined by the Medical Association of Britain at the time for bringing the profession of surgeon into disrepute. <laughs> real life. Um, he's, he's, wow. a, he's actually just, he's a, he's a really interesting character. Like, um, th- this same guy, Robert, after this, you know, he goes on in the during the war. Um, he decides that oh, this is really hard to explain. So he's a surgeon, right? Right. And he's in the army, so he's seen some wounds. Yeah. Yeah. So during the late thirties and early forties, he becomes um, he makes money on the side. His side hustle is giving expert evidence at ballistics on ballistics <laughs> in court. Okay. And in 1943, he writes a book called The Identification of Firearms and Forensic Ballistics. And that that was in use as a general textbook up until the 60s or 70s when they're teaching like pathologists and stuff. Huh. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And um, once he gets out of the war, he stays in the army for a couple of years, you know, for another two or three years. Mm-hmm. And in the late 40s or the early 50s, he or the late 40s, he retires, like he, he retires from the army mm-hmm. and he goes to Scotland and he opens up a, a fisheries on the coast, you know? Yeah. Now, I don't know what a fishery is. I think it might be, you know, you've got a lodge and stuff and guys come up and stay with you on the lake and you take them out fishing and stuff like that. Okay. I think it might be that or it could be, it's unclear, um, or it could be like a serious thing where you've got fishing boats and you're buying you buying fish off the fishing boats and processing it, you know? That's and, what I would think it is, but it could have been different. Yeah, I, yeah, that's what I would picture too. But then I didn't think it was, I thought he'd be more chilled or something. I don't know. Maybe he's good at, <laughs> may, well, actually, he's good at admin and stuff, so maybe he did enjoy that. Um, 
in the 1950s, um, he's appointed, um, he joins the, the kind of foreign service again, okay. bored with the fisheries business. And in 1950, he's sent over as a medical officer and he's chief medical officer for the British Empire in Papua New Guinea. Hmm. Yeah, what a life like, what a crazy life. I mean, seems like he's a bit, he takes opportunity, you know. Yeah. He wasn't tied down to like what he went to school for. Yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, interesting person. Yeah, and he. Do you remember the first couple? Just to bring, just to try and tie these threads together. Yes. The first couple that saw it, yeah. Yeah. They said that it was about twenty foot long. It had a long neck, four flippered feet, and it had a head about the size of a horse. Okay. Okay. Now your friend and mine, Marmaduke Weatherall. Never saw the animal, but he said, judging by the feet and by, you know, the physical evidence, mm -hmm. he would say that it is a very powerful, soft-footed animal about 20 feet long. Yeah? Okay. Now, the surgeon, who is level-headed, said that what he saw was the neck of a creature that he would estimate to be about eight foot long. Hmm. So there's a huge discrepancy there, you know? Yeah. And that's... I mean, Maybe that's, it was a baby. That's what I got to say about what it. Was, like, what if it's a baby? What do you mean? What or a teenager. Um, they don't all... It could, oh, yeah, sorry. I mean, it could have been a young... <laughs> it could have been a younger one, yeah. I mean, I, I, read, I read one place that on. biologists were saying like that one of the reasons that they don't think there's any real stock in it is to, to have a creature survive for that long in the lake you would need a breeding population of about a hundred, you know? Right. So, I mean, that seems like a lot of creatures, doesn't it? Um, but it's a big lake. Yeah, I mean, after after this picture comes out, people flocking to the lake spikes up, there's a huge big deal, and it becomes a whole thing. I like that. You know? Mm -hmm. um, this guy's name... Robert Kenneth Wilson, his name is only mentioned in the newspapers once. After that, it's called the surgeon's photo, you know? Right. And they allude to him being a surgeon with experience in the army, et cetera, et cetera, you know? Yeah. Um, and it goes on then from about 1934 all the way through, little sightings, people rushing into pubs off the road going, I saw it, I saw it just there, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, guys giving statements to newspapers that they were out walking the dog and they saw the monster in the lake, etc., etc. Right. And it kind of builds from there. And then in 1954, um, oh, me and my terrible notes. Uh, in 1954, there's these uh, sonar readings are taken, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, while, they're, while they're going along, um, what's it? Yeah, while they're going along, the person whose name I have not written down here for some bloody reason, the person that did the sonar uh, readings um, claims that they made contact with something, like they detected something on the sonar when they were about 800 meters away from it. Okay. And as they got close to it, um, it's, it seemed to interact with them, turn around and follow their boat along at a depth of 146 meters. Oh. Um, and it, it followed them along for ages. And then at the deepest part of the lake, it just seemed to dive out of their sonar range and they couldn't pick it up anymore. <clears throat> like this is a deep lake. Like that's that's the bones of 500 feet mm -hmm. that this thing was, that the guy claims this thing was following them along underwater, you know? After that... Does sonar not get recorded? Um, I don't know if it did in 1954. Oh, right, 54. Yeah, but anyway, it it drives people, it kind of drives people crazy, right? Yeah. And um, the, the, it sets off a whole slew of people that start to come and do sonar stuff on Loch Ness. Okay. You know? Um, I mean, I, I remember when I was a kid, um, one of the biggest things was that National Geographic, this is before they became Nat Geo and, you know, started doing weird ancient aliens and pseudo-archaeological stuff and that kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. This is back when they were actually a documentary organization from the National Geographic Society. Like, Before they were purchased by Robert Murdoch, or whatever his name is. Rupert. 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 Rupert Murdoch, yeah. Um, where, does he own them, yeah? 
National Geographic? It's not that surprising. Yeah. No. It's not that surprising. <laughs> so yeah, so I remember there was a big deal when they came over and they were going to do sonars in the lake and stuff, you know. Mm. Um, it so there's like there's a different small and large scale sonar project going on every two or three years for the next two decades, you know. Right. And then in 1972, um, these two guys, Robert Rains and Sir Peter Scott, mm-hmm. um, they they claim that while they were out doing some photography stuff, looking for the monster, mm-hmm. that they photographed a triangular shaped fin at the edge of one of their frames and that they had been held onto it for ages and they uh, couldn't decide you know, they, they wanted to be sure before they published, but now they're publishing anyway, and they're saying that they suspect that this is a creature that lives in the lake. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as you can imagine, with a name like Sir Peter Scott, this guy is kind of respected, you know? Yeah. So the crack with these two guys is uh, Robert Rains is, is a, an American lawyer, mm-hmm. and... Um, He's like a lawyer kind of producer character, yeah? Okay. Um, Where are we? And he claims that that he has seen Nessie, and he said that it was a large, darkish lump uh, covered with rough mottled skin, um, like the back of an elephant. Okay. Um, But that this, this is basically what he had seen in the water and then the triangular shaped fin and the whole lot. He's seen a lot of it, you know? Mm hmm. Um, and that's 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 what he's claiming. Yeah, the other guy then is Sir Peter Scott. Sir Peter Scott is the only child of Robert Falcon Scott. Robert Falcon Scott. Scott of the Antarctic. Oh. Oh. That is the dude. <sighs> Why? You sound disappointed. Nothing. It's just, you know... When I was researching... It's going to turn into the the child is trying to uh, either uphold or outshine his father's legacy. But, I mean, you've got a lot to live <laughs> up to if your dad is Bob Scott. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's it's thing. Like, can you can you clarify who this guy is, um, Dad? Yeah, for, for those that may not know. Yeah, Robert Scott was one of the early twentieth century um, explorers that went to conquer the Arctic. Uh, this was a kind of a race mainly, between them and the Russians. Was it? It was bet- it was mainly between Br- the British Empire and the Norwegians, and oh, some, right. sometimes other people got involved. Um, but it was really for queen and country kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, and kind of a I, measuring what's in your pants kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, th- that's just who who Scott was like, you know. But his only son is this dude, Peter Scott. Which I just think is very interesting. It is know? interesting. Yeah. So anyway, these two guys, these Robert Rains guy and uh, Sir Peter Scott, they published a paper in nineteen seventy five. Mm-hmm. And it's based on a picture that they, that Rains took in 1972 and showed to Scott straight away, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Excuse it's me. Easy. And they said that, that they can say with a high degree of confidence, um, they can state a high degree of confidence in the existence of, um, of a something in Loch Ness. Mm-hmm. Uh, la, 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 um, that the, the uh, Ness monster has a diamond-shaped fin um, and that they wouldn't be drawn on describing it anything other than that, but that they would give it a scientific name, and it was Nessie Rhomboterex. 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 Nessiteria Rhombo... Rhombopterex. <laughs> okay. I think. <laughs> um... And then both of them then went on to kind of claim in it that that they would say that there is a kind of a population of about 30 of these things living in the lake, that they live deep in the lake, and that they're uh, maybe mammals or whatever. 
but they don't have to surface as often as you would think for water or for air, and when they do, you might not see them, etc. So they're hidden deep, deep in the lake. Okay. You know? Um, I suppose the other thing to, to point out is that um, a lot of people suspect that this might be a hoax. What? This triangular fin-shaped picture. You can actually look it up, like. Yeah. Um, it looks like, do you know if you have a really bad quality black and white photo? And yes. then you photocopy it. And then you photocopy it again. And then yeah. maybe, do you know what I mean? You photocopy that photocopy. Mm -hmm. If you did that about a thousand times, this is what this would look like. And this is an enhanced photograph of the edge of one. Like, it could literally be anything. It could be a bit of kelp. <laughs> it could be anything, like. And um, I suppose the thing that a lot of people started to suspect is that... Um, To do is that this the name here necessary rhombic extracts or something like that mm -hmm. um it it's actually an anagram of peter scott hoax really <laughs> i believe so yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so a lot of people started to suspect that as well hmm. um peter scott had a child as well sir peter scott this this isn't important but guess what the kid was called Nessie. falcon Oh, his middle name. No, no, that's his first name, Falcon Scott. No, no, I mean... That's his dad's middle name. His dad's middle his name. His dad's middle name was Falcon, yeah. Like, you know you're on to something if you're... Do you know? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's enough of that racket. Um, I suppose the next major event in Loch Ness that happened was a guy called Morris Chambers passed away. Okay. And um, uh, Morris Chambers passes away... And his family are clearing up his papers and his personal effects and stuff. And in a box in the attic, um, they find an awful lot of papers that seem to suggest that back in the 30s, he was involved in a rather ornate hoax on Loch Ness. Ooh. And the hoax names a guy called, um, an artist called Christian um, Sperling. Was he the man with the, the coat rack? What? Was he the man with the hat rack? No, hang on now. <laughs> yeah, he na they, they, name a, they name a guy called... Oh my God, I only noticed this now. They name a guy called Christian Sperling as the artist that made the, the model, you know? Yeah. And then they contact Christian Sperling just before he passes away. <gasps> and he says, Oh yeah, that Loch Ness Monster thing from like 60 years ago. Yeah, um, well, the thing is, I was good friends with uh, Duke Weatherall, the famous actor Duke Weatherall, and he came to me with like this plastic boat toy, and he was like, can we put a neck on this and make it float? And I was like, uh, sure, sure, why not? So he made the fake Nessie thing. Him, uh, Morris Chambers, Christian Sperling, Marmaduke Weatherall, and our friend, uh, Robert uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Wilson, mm -hmm. the surgeon, they all made this this plot together, and it was apparently because Marmaduke was embarrassed that the that the Daily Mail had called him out as a hoaxer. <laughs> so, he, <laughs> so he wanted to make an even more elaborate hoax. Wow, one that he wouldn't get caught out in this time. And they're all sitting around going, "But how won't you get caught out with it?" And he goes, "Well, I'm going to tell you." Bob, you're a surgeon, right? <laughs> and they basically were playing off of your man's good reputation, like. Mm. And apparently your man was a bit of a laugh as well. So yeah, that was all a hoax anyway. Um, huh. By weather all, yeah. And they've admitted to that, specifically. Though. Well, it was found out, like, they found the guy's papers, but the only one of them that was still alive was this guy, Christian Sperling, you know? And, I mean, Christian Sperling could have been joking about it as well. Do you know? Mm. Um, but that's that's the crack, like, um, and I don't know, like that's it. Like then there's, but there's loads. Of, like to this day, the Loch Ness thing goes on, yeah. Right. Um, like there's a guy called Steve Feltham, you know, and Steve Feltham, I had li I had listened to a podcast where they interviewed him before, you know, mm -hmm. and he's like the f most famous Nessie hunter. Um, he's been living on the lake for like 60 or for 60 for like 30 years, you know, okay. um, he's about 60 years of age now. Yeah. 
So check it out. In 1991, yeah, he Steve had visited Loch Ness the first time when he was seven on a family holiday. Yeah, okay. he's from down the south of England, and he had visited a number of times during his childhood and adolescence. And then in 1991, um, he left his home, his job, and his girlfriend to travel up to Loch Ness to look for the Loch Ness monster, at the age of 28. Interesting. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it? Like, you'd have to be going through some stuff. It's, that's the thing. To leave. Your girlfriend, your everything home. Everything you have. He owned the house as well. He talks about that, how he had bought the house, like. And he let, so he dropped the, the house, the girlfriend, and the thing. Like, that's a man with commitment issues. Yeah. Isn't it? Or, like, I mean, I remember what it was like to be 28. Like, you're, like, you're, you're, you're young enough to think that there is such a thing as a grown-up. But you're, you're old enough to worry that maybe you'll never become a grown-up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but then you're not old enough to know that becoming a grown-up is is not all that great, really. Do you know? Well, it's not all that different either. It's not all that different, no. But he's, he's I, like, I could just see a guy in his late 20s and she's like, Hey, Steve, you want to settle down, have some children? And Steve is like, I got to go find this monster, babe. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I choose the cryptid. I'm so sorry, Nelly. I got to, I got to. <laughs> You'll never be enough. Yeah, I'm just, I got to go, babe. You don't understand. It's the truth is out there. Red flag, number one. <laughs> yeah, so he drops, he drops everything. And, um, and he just moves up there. And his cousin that lives up there gets him an old disused library and he lives in that no he lives in a library a mobile a mobile oh. <laughs> a mobile library so it's okay. actually okay. it's actually more like a big bus big bus <laughs> so he lives in a big bus um he's a photographer you can go to his website steve felton and um, he has lovely photos of of Loch Ness, and i'd say that's how he survives you know mm. but he's also he mentions it on his website he mentioned it in two of the podcasts i listened to with him that he um uh, that he makes these nessie models and he sells them to tourists as well you know yeah um he's an interview for his birthday in i think it was 2019 or 2020 um and he said that he had now spent over 10,000 days on the shores of the lake looking for nessie yeah um that's a bit unhinged it is slightly yeah uh, um, he seems to be yeah, having a real. He's living his best life. Then fine. He seems to be having a real good time, though. To be quite honest, like yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, when he got there in 1991, he spent two years just sitting there, walking up and down, looking at the lake, and he never saw anything. And then one night, um, he caught a glimpse of an un, an unexplained disturbance in the water. Yeah. Um, but he didn't have his camera on him. Of course not. Um, and then he says that. In all of his uh, 30 years, over 30 years of looking at the lake, he's only seen a handful of things that he would think maybe that's messy, you know? Yeah. Um, when he got there first, he thought it was a pleosaur. Yeah? Am I saying that right? Pleosaur? I think so. But the thing about it is, and I went and looked into this, pleosaurs, uh, what you may call it, um... What what do you call those guys? The paleontologists? Paleontologists um, think that pleosaurs wouldn't have been able to take a photograph like Nessie because their necks weren't, they couldn't support their massive heads outside of the water. Right. Like they would have only been in the water with those long necks. Right. And when you go and look at pleosaurs as well, like you can bring up all, like they, pleosaurs were like a species that was around for 200 million years, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And you can see there are like loads of different types of pleosaurs and only some of them have those big long necks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he thought that maybe it was one of these Wells catfish, you know, like a massive catfish. With a long neck? No, no, it might have just been a big one, you know? Because do you remember I when I suggested that the guy in um, the Ogopogo might have been a... Um, a sturgeon and you said a sturgeon and then I showed you a picture of five guys holding a sturgeon Ah, do you remember the huge fish yes so like he suggested that it might be one of these catfish but then the thing about it is that they've done um, 
DNA analysis of what they can find in the lake. Mm-hmm. And they've only ever found stuff like eel and um, like carp or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, But very little. Like, I can't stress this enough. The lake itself is not as diverse and thriving an ecosystem as you would think. And it never particularly was, you know? Mm. It's just too deep. It's it's dendro, it's dendrophilic. Is that the right word? Dendro... No, hang on. I don't think so. No, not that. But <laughs> I don't think that's the right no, word. No, it darling. isn't the right word. <laughs> There's not enough light for plant life to survive on large enough stretches of it for it to support anything above that in the food chain. Yeah. Is what I'm trying to say. How do yeah. people use tweezers? Do people put that in with a tweezer? Yeah, some people only diamond paint with tweezers. And I was like, sure, ooh, let me see if I can get three at a time. That's crazy. Nope. I can't even get two. Um. So anyway, he thinks that. And then he was saying, he said like that he's really not sure. For someone that's dedicated his life, like more than half his life at this stage to it. Um, he's probably just happy not to be uh, nailed down to Melanie <laughs> down in the south of Spain with a mortgage and like two kids or whatever. Yeah. Although, you know, the kids would be out of your hair by now, Steve, you know? I mean, um, it's fine if he doesn't have a relationship, <laughs> but he doesn't have to like... When I read that, I was like... And he puts it in every single article. It's like, Steve, does, that does not make you look good. No. <laughs> you know? oh, Steve. Like, even if you just left the girlfriend out, if you said, I just left my home and my job, it, then that doesn't seem so bad. But when it's the girl, when you put that in as well, it's like, it's so next level, Patty. It's, <laughs> it's just crazy. Like, um, what's the crack? So he's, for the last 14 years, he ha- he's, he's been going out with this woman, Hillary, you know? Yeah. And, um, so they've been together for 14 years. Yeah. She is absolutely not convinced that there is any such thing as Nessie. And he even says, like, oh, you know, I think the vast majority of uh, things can be explained. And he goes, certainly of the ones we can't explain, they're probably something mundane. But there's those small percentage, which, again, is the kind of stuff J. Allen Hynek was saying about UFOs and all that, you know? Like, you can't rule out absolutely everything. It doesn't have a logical explanation. Yeah, because what if there's a portal? What if something crosses over? Yeah, a portal in the depths of the lake. Yeah. Yeah, that could happen. Yeah, I, don't I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that there was a portal in a lake, right? Yeah, no, I wouldn't say so. Do you want to hear the good news or the bad news? Um, bad news first. Are we getting both? Um, I mean... The... <laughs> Can we make this a choose-your-own-adventure video? Yeah. <laughs> well, like... The, the bad news is that it's a big lake and there's a lot of places to check, you know? Yeah. And the good news is that you can go to Loch Ness sightings and they have webcams set up around the shores of the lake. Ooh, they have live webcams? Yeah, and they like it's an interesting enough website if you go to it, Loch Ness sightings, uh, dot com. <laughs> uh, they have live webcams. And every once in a while... Are you sponsored? No, no. They have live webcams, and every once in a while, uh, things just go cuckoo bananas on there, you know? Oh. Um, yep, so I forgot to put down whether this happened this year or last year. <laughs> I'm really bad at notes. Um, I think it was, I think this might have happened um, in 2021. Yeah? Maybe. I believe it did. I could look it up. Hang on there. Well, no, don't waste their time. Uh, yeah, it's uh, bah, 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 bah. this happened. <laughs> in tw- this happened in 2021. Yeah, in 2021 on Loch Ness sightings, a whole host of things happened. Okay. Like a whole host of sightings happened really quick together. So there's this lady called um, uh, Kaylin Wango, who is 28 and she's from Oregon, mm-hmm. which you will notice is on the east coast of America, of North America. No, it's the west coast. I'm sorry, the other one, the other, the other west, the other coast, the west coast, <laughs> the which coast. is on the west coast of North America, which is like literally in the double figure thousands of miles away from Loch Ness. Yeah. Yes. And she's sitting at home and she's checking out the webcam and then she sees this dark shape looking under, moving underneath it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and this happened on March 17th, Patrick's Day. Okay. Can you believe that? 
um, on 2021. Now, um, Keelan actually has um, a YouTube channel and everything. Oh. Um, and I went and looked at it, um, but it's actually just the webcam that she's got up there. Um, anyway, um, what's the crack? A couple of quotes from Keelan, right? Okay. From the paper. I personally have had some strange encounters in my life, okay. including one with an essay type creature. Okay. She never goes on to explain that, like contextualize that. Where did it happen? What age were you? When did it happen or anything like this? Um, and then later on, um, when they ask her, you know, what she thinks Nessie is and what's going on with it, um, she can see, she says, um, I can tell you that whatever these creatures, oh, she, they ask her, like, what do you think it is and what do you think it's doing and stuff? She goes like, um, I can tell you whatever these creatures really are, they're very intelligent and they know how to hide. They could be watching you from just underneath the surface of the water mm -hmm. and you would never know they were there. Which is exciting and a little bit scary. That's the, that's is this the bad news? Well, well, like the good news is you too can be an Nessie watcher. And the bad news is you, <laughs> you too can be an Nessie watcher. So oh, that's dear. March 17th, right? Right. And hot on the heels of that then, um, on March the 23rd, so about six days later, mm -hmm. um, a guy who is actually Irish, um, and he is a cleric, he's a clerical officer in a hospital in Donegal. Okay. And his name is, I'm just going to find his name. A doodle doodle doo. He is Owen O'Fahagain. So Owen is watching exactly the same webcam yep. and he sees a kind of thing come out of the water and go slink, 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 slink and then in under the water, yeah? Yeah. Um, and he said, um, he said that he personally has been going to Loch Ness all the time and that's how he got into checking out the Loch Ness cameras mm -hmm. and that his first sighting was back in uh, 1987 and he has registered 14 sightings of the creature. So the way it works is you watch the webcam. Um, and if you think you see something, mm -hmm. you log it and put your name beside it. Okay. And then someone will review it and it will either become an official Nessie sighting or not an official Nessie sighting. And mm. when Owen, <laughs> I didn't include it here, but it's actually quite funny. <laughs> when Owen, when Owen logged this one, it was initially... They were like straight away, oh yeah, Owen's solid. He's had 14 sightings of Nessie, like. So they originally said, yeah, no problem. And then the next day they pulled it and said that it wasn't an official sighting anymore. And then four days later, they put it back on as an official sighting, like. Um, and he, he mentioned this in two of the articles I read. What did he see? He just, he literally saw, like you can go just and like a thing find this. Like this. It's, do you know, it's not even that exciting. Um, it's not even that exciting but like yeah hang on so like that's on to the to you to you I mean like you can you can go <laughs> to this lochnesssightings.com and you can look at the webcam right now hashtag not sponsored if you'd like it's uh, totally not sponsored like yeah but you can go there right now and look at the webcam like there's people all over the world so the original one is Kaylin Wangle right right then there's Owen of mm -hmm. the next one is um, like three days later on March 26th is a lady called Rosalind Casey and she's in Leeds on the east coast of Britain yeah. of England and and that's that's in 2021 like and that's the last time there was a massive flare up of like Nessie sightings and they were all around the same time were they? they're all within um, like nine days of each other yeah mm. Maybe that's when it came up for air. They're all. I mean, I've I've watched I've watched Kaylin's one and I've watched Owen's one several times because I was just like, oh, what is this? Do you know? And then I watched it again, like kind of going, oh, what is this? Um, and not in a mysterious like when you read the transcript of that. <laughs> it's yeah, it's hard to make out. Um, in the one that Kaylin has, like, 
basically just this dark shape that looks vaguely like it might be a pleosaur comes up near the surface or or maybe it's reflected from a cloud or something you know and then it seems to recede back into it like yeah um i mean wouldn't it be in their best interest to create hoaxes like sightings i suppose it would like like it wouldn't be that hard to like make things happen on the camera not at all, no. No, not at all. Um, you should see, I mean, the webcams as well are, you know, they're webcam quality and they're taking in a huge area of the lake, you know. Okay. Um, I, I suppose the thing about it, though, is that, like, Nessie will never die because to the local area, it's estimated by the Scottish government that it's worth £40 million a year. Yeah. You know? Like, that's like... I mean, I wouldn't mind getting a Nessie plushie. Yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> the, the thing about Nessie as well is, when I was reading about your man Steve Feltham, you know, mm-hmm. I came across this interview by another guy who who was interviewing a friend of his who had spent uh, more than a decade of his life looking for Nessie along the lakes, you know? Mm-hmm. And he, like, in the interview, within the first bit or whatever, they were like, oh, hey, so I never took this guy's name. I just read it. I laughed. And then I closed the tab. And then I went to try and find it later on. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find it. And I was so regretful. But he said, basically, in the first question, it was like, so how long have you lived here, Steve? Oh, I've lived here over, like, 10 years. And I've been, you know, looking for Nessie. How many times have you seen him? I've had 38 sightings. 38 sightings? He goes, that's amazing. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of them are quite brief. And he goes, well, what would you say is the average sighting? And he said, well, the average sighting would be about six seconds. The vast majority of them are a lot less than six seconds. But So, like, basically, this guy is like, and he goes, and a lot of them take place in the evening or early in the morning. And it's like, so when the light is weird, right, and you're walking down the lake, he counts anything that breaks the surface. And he turns around and just sees it disappear as a sighting. Like, that's a trout, mate. Do you know? <laughs> one of, but one of the things they found in the lake is eels. And an eel will definitely do that. Yeah. You know? Um, but, like, these Nessie guys, it's exactly the same opinion I have as Bigfoot. Very unlikely. But, you know, it's a lot better than a lot of other stuff you could be doing. Mm. Like, even if you, if you spend your whole life looking for Nessie and you never found them. Like, you spend your whole life walking up and down beside a really nice lake camping and you know having talking a w- smack about your ex-girlfriend having a walk yeah <laughs> <laughs> cutting the legs off melanie <laughs> it's 30 years melanie let it go <laughs> she's so petty <laughs> oh man well that's interesting because i didn't actually know any of that about loch ness yeah that's that's it. I mean, there's 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 no end of stuff you can read about Loch Ness. When I was when I was looking into it, all of these guys, loads of guys I haven't mentioned either, like they're all in a documentary um, called Incident at Loch Ness. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what's this incident? I think it's called Incident at Loch Ness. What's this incident at Loch Ness? And I looked it up, and it's a documentary where Werner Herzog is the guy that's following them around talking to them. Oh, and I. File that away in my brain as I have to watch Werner Herzog talk to the Loch Ness people. That would be out- that sounds really fun. That would be outstanding, you know. Yeah. Yes, but what about the existential nature of Nessie riding and disappearing into the darkness, only to rise again and bring man's blood up to make him <laughs> angry at the world for its? Do you know what I mean? Like, what? Like that would be so amazing, like. Just to hear Werner Herzog's take on that, like, mm-hmm. the drama, the human drama. I do a terrible Werner Herzog impersonation. You're trying. I'm not dry enough or long enough. <laughs> anyway, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. Um, a- any questions? Anyone out there? Oh, me, is it? Yeah, I mean, it just... I mean, um... Not really. I think it's very interesting that that people have such a strong connection to these cryptids. They really do, yeah. Yeah, people do. It says something about the, the psyche, I guess. But he's not in any way the last, like, Owen there, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, Kalen, 
all of these people, they're all like right now, there's probably someone watching that, that webcam because that's what they do every day at this time. They check that webcam out, you know? Yeah, it's like bookmarked. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. I'll have to go check that out. Yeah, it's um, Loch Ness Sightings.com. <laughs> How many times have you said it? I think you should reach out uh, for About Loch Ness Sightings.com? <laughs> I'm not being paid by Loch Ness Sightings.com. <laughs> I just I really believe in Loch Ness sure? Sightings.com. <laughs> Loch Ness Sightings.com is a great website. <laughs> right. Sure. I'm shutting this down. <laughs> it I it's yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, Loch Ness Sightings.com. That's all I <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with us yeah. today. Um I hope that all of you watching are well. I'm sure your fans wish you well as well. Do you want to say anything to your fans? Fans. Um <laughs> I think that's a bit LochnessSighting.com. Um, yeah, lo- LochnessSighting.com. Guys, uh, say I sent you. Um, Stop. Do yeah. not. Please. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> right, okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, look how much we got done today. That's quite a bit. It started off blank, did it? No, I had I had this one done. Uh, very impressive. Thank you. You're powering on. Yeah, it's a really fun one. Uh, the drills on this are a little bit... Um, like I got this back in October just as a sidebar here because I know that some people are really interested in the diamond painting as well um, they had a problem with the drills in the first run these diamonds yeah. but they've since fixed it so they do look a bit wonky here like they don't fit or they pop up sometimes but if you buy it now it it won't have that problem So anyway, um, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day, a wonderful week, and we will see you all very soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.